Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome back. Uh, for those of you that tuned into my earlier session or the Yang Zhao uh, session, uh, hi and welcome everyone to our fireside chat on collaborative platforms taking center stage. Um, we're here to discuss the rise and importance during the pandemic of collaboration platforms for presenting, facilitating, communicating, capturing, and all of the above and what it means going forward. We're very, very fortunate to have with us Michael Chasen, one of the founders of the well-known EdTech firm Blackboard and now one of the founders of Class Technology. Michael is going to start us off with a few minutes of background. And uh, from there, I will be asking questions. Um, audience, remember, if you have a question, you can type it into the chat and I may add it into the discussion, kind of depends on how things are going and how much time uh, that we have. Um, so, Michael, hey, thank you so much for being with us here at Learning Impact uh, 2021. And uh, now over to you to uh, share some background. Rob, thank you so much. And it is great to be here. I'm excited about today's discussion. Before we dive into things, I did think it made sense for me to maybe just take a minute or two and go ahead and tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing at Class Technologies. So um, it's really been a crazy year. Uh, literally started the company uh, just after the pandemic started, um, literally a year ago this month. Uh, since then, we've had over 20,000 inbound leads from institutions across K-12 higher ed and corporate training. We, we launched our product class on uh, Mac, Windows, Chromebook, iPad, Android tablets. We're already used at over 250 institutions. We've hired just over 200 employees now. We've already started expanding internationally, and we've actually raised over $160 million from leading investors who are some of the early investors, in fact, board members of Zoom, leading ed tech investors, as well as just uh, prominent individual investors as well. And it's been such an absolute crazy year because never would I have imagined that we've seen this type of interest and this type of momentum in a market. Um, and as I said, even though we only released our product just a couple of weeks ago, we already have over 250 early adopters across all of uh, the different markets. Now, what was so fascinating was all of this started because during the beginning of the pandemic, I was home with my three children and I saw the challenges that they were having getting engaged in the classroom. And I asked their professors, why are you having so much trouble engaging with students in these online classes? And the teacher said, look, Zoom is great for lectures and it's great for group discussions. But a lot of what we do in the physical classroom is so much more. We do everything from we, we take attendance, we hand out assignments, like we do work live in class. We, we might give a test or a quiz. Uh, we have group presentations. We have one-on-one -on -one discussions. Then we also might use the internet or watch videos or great items, as well as lecturing and, and, and group discussions. So about 60% though, of what we do in the physical classroom, you actually can't bring online um, with Zoom. So of course, uh, you know, as uh, you mentioned, and as many of your viewers may know, I was the co-founder and CEO of Blackboard. Uh, ran that company for, for 17 years. And uh, so I had a general expertise in the uh, ed tech space and my own background, I have my undergraduate degree in computer science. And I knew that Zoom is a software development kit, an SDK. And so I got together with a bunch of developers that I'd worked previously with at Blackboard that were experts in synchronous and asynchronous learning. And um, we took the Zoom SDK and we added to it teaching and learning tools, student engagement functionality, attendance and ID verification, proctored exams, seating charts and class management tools. And we ended up creating the very first essential synchronous learning app that lets teachers deliver an in-person classroom experience online. And the best way to understand that is I'll just kind of show you a couple of quick uh, screenshots. So what we did is we took Zoom and we slightly reimagined it. What if it was specifically built purposely for the classroom? Then we did things like taking the instructor out of the grid view and putting them up in what we call the instructor podium, creating an, uh, an idea of having a front of class so that the teacher goes, hey, I want my teaching assistants to be at the front of the class so you know who else you can be asking questions to. Or you can take students and say, hey, you three, you're gonna be presenting to the class, move to the front of the class like you would in a real classroom. We made it that you could give tests and quizzes all right from within Zoom. Uh, we, we wanted to better incorporate synchronous and asynchronous communications. So now when you're actually looking uh, at all of these video feeds of your student, if some of them are sending you a private message one-on-one, -on -one, right now a lot of times chats kind of get lost in Zoom. Well, this appears right on their video feed so the teacher knows, oh, hey, I have this uh, student, Mary, who's asking me a private question. Let me go ahead and answer that to make it a much more uh, interactive experience combining all of those different forms of communication. We added a proctored exam view so that you could, the teacher could very easily with the click of a button 
uh, not only see the student's face, but what's going on in their desktop. Not, not just to stop cheating, but to also, uh, like you were walking around a room, if a student had a problem, you can then pull up their screen live and say, oh, I see what you're doing wrong here. Let me help you out. And um, we, we enhance breakout rooms. We let it, uh, we enable the teachers to see all the breakout rooms from all, from one area all at once. And breakout rooms are so important to education. They can not only see what's happening in the breakout rooms, but they can see all the activity that's happened. They can see who's talking in the breakout rooms, who's raising their hands, who's giving feedback. And then you can even take and launch specific content to different breakout rooms. So you can say this breakout room one is going to have a quiz and breakout room two will have content. So when you, when you take a look at all those things that teachers do in the physical classroom, the idea behind class was we would bring all of that online. And the reason that that's important is because right now a lot of instructors lack the, the most basic tools they need to, to fully bring that in-person classroom experience online. And we wanted to allow teachers to focus straight on orchestrating their classrooms. And so we could help them by enabling those technologies online in Zoom. So hopefully that gives you just a little bit of background of why we started class, some of the great momentum we've seen, and a little bit about what our product does. But now I'm looking forward to engaging in a, in a conversation about what's happening overall in the um, virtual uh, in classroom space and a lot of the trends that we're seeing now, uh, both uh, you know, during and what we expect to see post-COVID. All right. Thank you, Michael. That was uh... That was very, very helpful introduction because I, I would doubt that the most of our viewers, including myself, were, were familiar with all the functionality. Although I, I did see some of it because uh, Class Technologies was a winner of one of our Learning Impact Awards this year. year and I, I watched the video and very, very impressive, I think. Um, you know, so one of the things, of course, everyone's involved in right now, and really it's kind of true in K-12 and higher ed, is, you know, this drive to kind of get back to normal, you know, kind of thing, uh, you know, get back to what we used to do, like bring the kids into, into school and um, uh, because that's better for them. And of course I noted your product is, um, you know, really filling some of the gaps there, but what do you think, I mean, do you feel that the use of Zoom is here to stay now uh, after the pandemic? Obviously it seems like your product would help along those lines, but what are you, seeing that's an incredible rise in the interest for your product but at the same time right now people are sort of saying no we want don't want to do online anymore or whatever so is that is that what are you seeing in terms of that i don't, I don't think this is binary as everyone is is, is trying to um to, to categorize as look mm -hmm. you can, we have trained hundreds of thousands of teachers and millions of students all around the world in online learning and, and you can't undo that and the mm -hmm. example i actually like to give is uh, it's similar to, to takeout. You know, I, I tried to explain to my kids the other day that when I grew up, you could only order Chinese food and pizza to be delivered to your home. And they're like, why those two very specific food uh, groups? Like, why only that? Because now right. you can order, of course, any restaurant you can think will deliver. And that's and, and that certainly picked up steam during the pandemic. And that got every single restaurant. I mean, heck, you can order more in steak delivered to your uh, apartment now. And that's not going back. And similarly, you can't train every teacher and student in the world in online learning and expect there to not be long-term ramifications about how people think about education. I think what's happened during the pandemic is online learning has moved up to maybe be like a second class of learning. It's now being on par with the way people want to primarily learn. And, and even though right now there might be a little bit of a snapback of a lot of schools saying, okay, we're all back in person. Let me tell you, no one is, no one is planning to, to be fully back and not because just of the Delta variant and what's happening as this pandemic continues, but because they recognize that they're now serving a more well-educated, more broad base that is interested in maybe not all of their learning being online, but certainly that being as one of the modes of learning uh, that they engage in. Mm -hmm. And I think you might have left out chicken delight. That was maybe the other, if you were really lucky, you could not only get the Chinese and the pizza, but, you had it. <laughs> but, the, but that's, a, that's about right. So, um, Look, is is the uh, you know you showed the features and and obviously those make a great deal of sense in terms of rather than talking about Zoom, talking about class, right, and what class can do to really uh, provide a much fuller environment. Is it? Do you think it's uh, class is better suited for K twelve or or higher ed or both? Is there would there be differences in the emphasis in in those? Uh, uh, two seg segments. You obviously know a lot about higher ed as well as K-12 now. So what do you think about that? 
Well, and, and let me even expand that. I mean, we're really um, focused in three markets, K-12, higher ed, and corporate. And the truth is okay. that across all three markets, there is a base level of functionality you need just to teach a class online. You, you have to be able to take attendance. You have to see who's there. You have to be able to communicate with the, the students in the room. You have to be able to give tests or quizzes. Um, you have to have a dashboard of the people's success. So mm -hmm. there's a core set of functionality that it works across all three. Now, the more mm -hmm. advanced functionality ends up being different for each market. K-12 might want some uh, younger, more engaging uh, uh, um, uh, type of teaching tools that they look at gamification. In higher ed, you have more of like peer review. In corporate, you want to link to certificates. So uh, on the more advanced side, there's certainly a difference there. But the very basic of taking attendance, handing out assignments, giving tests or quizzes, proctoring mm -hmm. exams, or having a dashboard of your data is fundamental across all of them. And, and for our first version, that's what we focused on. The features that are needed across all of the markets to just successfully be able to teach online. Okay. In terms of though the sort of market movement in selling, I saw your chart. I, it was went by pretty quickly there, but it looked like it was actually quite balanced in terms um, of those markets. Is that what's happening or is it maybe it's, moving a little faster in one uh, or the other? It, it's interesting. <laughs> um, very different across all the markets. So to, to kind of uh, sort of the corporate training market, I can tell you, um, they moved all of their education online and they're not going back. And actually what they found was that as opposed to a lot of companies do kind of like self-paced learning that they might have, what they found was that this synchronous learning actually gets everybody to attend it. If you tell someone, hey, you're going to go take your management class, it's self-paced, do it when you get around to it, they don't always get around to it. If you tell them that right. it's seven o'clock on Wednesday and there's an instructor, everybody shows up. So corporate training is actually continuing to increase post-pandemic because they're seeing the success. Mm -hmm. Then now in higher ed, um, every college at this point had a online course or degree or program prior to the pandemic. Um, if, if anything, the, the big change we're seeing in higher ed is they're keeping all of their online courses, they're adding some more, and the students themselves have a higher expectation of a bigger part of the online course being synchronous. So we've seen some courses that were, it was an online course and you meet once every other week for some teacher office hours, and now they're changing it to, hey, we're gonna have live class twice a week because that's what people got to expect during the pandemic. K-12 is the one area that we were starting to see as, as a lot of them thought the pandemic was over, shrinking. I mean, easily, I think 30, 40% uh, of the schools were telling us, okay, the pandemic's over. We're going to migrate off of using Zoom. But the more exciting thing is the fact that over 50% were saying, hey, actually, no, even if this pandemic's over, we don't want to be caught flat-footed if there's another pandemic, or we're going to start to have like one or two supplemental classes online, or we're going to have a more advanced class online or teachers office hours online, we're going to start dipping our toe in this water because we recognize we just put through all these kids and train them in online learning. And we want to take advantage of that. So to me, K-12 is where higher ed was almost about 10 years ago, where they're just now starting to really, uh, I mean, they've gotten everyone trained and see the benefits. So to me, K-12 is going to be actually our highest long-term growth, even for the short term right now, it's still the, the smallage, smallest use case. Yeah, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the IMS uh, member school districts, um, the ones that felt most comfortable during the pandemic were ones that have, had already sort of planned for virtual school days, you know, snow days, things like that. And I could see I could see this platform fitting well into, you know, plans for that as well as now expanding the models. But that's kind of what the next uh, question is about, you know, they're particularly in higher ed, there's been something uh, folks have called uh, high, high, high flex. And it's, it's uh, you know, that with the, and the, the way I'll explain that, uh, hopefully I'll get it right, is, you know, the pandemic, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the difference between a hybrid course where the students may be online or in class, right? And, or a blended course where more resources are online, especially supplemental resources, where, you know, sort of the typical example there, is the ability to flip the class. So the students are still meeting in the class, but there are more, you know, there are more resources online. And, um, uh, you know, so that's the, that's an example where a teacher can use the class time for interaction rather than lectures. And um, those lectures might be delivered online and so forth. Do you have any thoughts uh, so far on what we might be seeing in those evolution of those models or maybe other models, um, you know, going forward based on, because you'd be right in the middle of that discussion, I would think. Oh, and, and we are. And I'll, I'll tell you some very specific that you'll find interesting kind of technology um, avenues that have spun off because of that. But um, look, it's not just that. I mean, first of all, you have schools that are going back and 
even at, at a minimum level of uh, taking into consideration the Delta variant, they're saying, hey, if someone's infected and you contact trace, you find out you're home for two weeks. So they're making mm-hmm. sure to set up their classes so that people can dial into their classes. There was a huge investment in Zoom room technology and third-party camera technology. So a lot of the colleges and two of the K-12 schools have purposely set that up to have that, that flex learning uh, mm-hmm. capability. But then you actually you, you, you find out some very interesting um, changes you need to make to the technology. So we're actually coming out with a whole pack of features around flex learning. Because for example, what that means is that you might have 30 kids, and let's even say you do have a Zoom room set up. So all the students in the in the class can see all the uh, people that are dialing in at the front of the room on a, on a, on a Zoom room display. But when the teacher is then sending out content to get it to everybody, even those kids in the classroom need to be on Zoom. So you have everyone sitting there with their computers and they're on Zoom, but there's limited bandwidth in the school. So you need to be able to reduce streaming for the people that are in class, but maintain it for the kids that are at home. So that, that way the, the teacher can go ahead and distribute. You need to automatically mute all of the kids in the classroom so you don't get this constant feedback loop, but yet allow all the kids at home to obviously have, have the sound on. So there's a whole bunch of things that are like very specific technology tweaks that you need to make to successfully run in that multimodal format that we're incorporating in class because schools have told us that they're planning on having this type of a flex learning environment, whether it's to support the Delta variant or just to support now the kids that may be at home for one reason or another or want to stay home, um, but they still want them to be an active part of that class. So we actually have as part of our product roadmap, a whole set of features to make it possible to easily adapt whether the students are in the room or now. And I can tell you that the number of schools we're talking about that are, are very high and it is definitely mm-hmm. a trend you're going to be seeing and hearing and more of uh, seeing and hearing more of this year. Yeah, I could, I can really see that as being very valuable uh, feature because we can't even imagine all of the, all of the various scenarios right at this point in time. Um, so uh, obviously Zoom is a uh, product, you know, that uh, um, is, is focused on uh, video um, and you're adding features around that. There, there are other, uh, I'd say particularly in higher ed, but, but also in other, in K-12 to some extent, uh, use of various types of, other types of video platforms. So for instance, uh, video streaming platforms like a Kaltura, or uh, classroom capture platforms, perhaps like a, a Panopto. Are, are these products, um, how, do, how do they fit, you know, in terms of the, the, the sector for you? Are they competitors or, or how, should, how do you think about them in terms of fitting with what class is doing? Well, I think these are all supporting technologies that really enable institutions to be able to just bring their classes online. And it's often done in different ways. What Zoom is usually utilized for is if you're really having a, live interactive class, um, you know, and you might have, whether it's uh, uh, 20, 50, or 100 people, Zoom is really the best avenue for that. They have the biggest backend architecture to handle the most streaming at the same time, the smoothest video, the sharing capabilities. That's why Zoom has really become kind of the standard, if you will, for classes online. We've even seen that with schools that are full Microsoft schools with Microsoft Teams. Um, even then, the, the teachers often are using Zoom for their classes. So it really has become the standard. Kaltura, a great company. Uh, a lot of schools use them primarily to really do more of like a broadcasting of large lecture classes or lecture or to record the classes. And that all can be used in conjunction with Zoom as well. So I don't look at it at all as um, competitive as far as just much more complementary technologies that we use together really can help an institution fully embrace having an online learning environment. Right. Okay. So um you brought up uh, teams. Uh, so, so the, you know, another big kind of rise in use during the pandemic, it's been in quite a few areas, almost all of them <laughs> related to learning technology, but it's been the, you know, Microsoft Teams, the Google Classroom, um, uh, other, other products that may in theory be seen more like there's some sort of collaboration or productivity tools, is it the same answer? Are they just also complementary uh, to, to what you're doing or are they special in some way in terms of how you're looking at integrating into schools or universities? Well, certainly there are some schools that are just Microsoft schools and they're even holding their classes on Microsoft Teams. Similarly, they're especially more so in K-12, you have schools that are using Google Classroom, so therefore they might use Google uh, Meet Hangouts. Um, so th- there are kind of competing platforms to Zoom. What we really do is a little bit different. Those are all like direct competitors to Zoom, but if you really want to have a 
online meeting platform specialized in replicating that physical classroom experience online. You know, right now, you know, we're really the only solution. And we, we built on top of Zoom because Zoom is really one of the most, if not the most scalable and secure solutions out there. And we wanted to be able to leverage that as our backend architecture. Um, but there are other solutions that schools might look to if they just want to, you know, hold the equivalent of an online meeting. So if the basic feature set of, uh, you know, Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google, we'd have 20 people and you can kind of all uh, talk at once and just give a lecture and you don't need any specialized, you know, attendance tracking or teaching learning tools or tests and quizzes, then all three of those are great platforms. And, you know, we're just happy to, to, to see the interest in schools and utilizing this technology to create uh, a more engaging environment. But when you're ready for that next level, when you say, okay, the, the online classroom is about more than just a group discussion, when you want to be able to really have individual one-on-one -on -one conversations with your students, when you want to have more tools to manage the class, when you want to be able to proctor, when you want to have different forms of multimodal communication all simultaneously, when you want to have a system that supports uh, you know, flex learning, that's when people often come to us and talk to us about using class technologies. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so let's pretend we're on uh, CNBC now for a second, and you know you're an uh, experienced CEO, and you know a lot about the LMS uh, marketplace because you helped create it. <laughs> um, and so, sh should should LMSs be adding? What should they be do, doing? Should they be adding Zoom to their LMS, or should they be adding you know class? What 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 would be your answer to that? Right. Well, just about all of the LMSs have uh, used uh, the open standards of LTI, uh, as do we. So uh, a lot of schools, you launch Zoom right from within Blackboard or right from within mm -hmm. uh, Instructure or right from within Moodle. So they already have an integration with a large synchronous platform. Now, the schools we're talking to are saying, OK, well, we want to now upgrade, if you will, Zoom to you, you know class for Zoom. So um, they then right from within, as I said, Blackboard or Instructure or Moodle, you can then launch you know class uh, on top of Zoom, just the same way that they're currently launching Zoom. So it's not a change for any of these schools, or it's not a change for the LMS. They already have integration points using LTI into uh, the Zoom synchronous learning tool, which means that they have integration points into using class on top of Zoom. Right, right. But if you were still CEO of Blackboard, would you be, in, not that you would necessarily want to be at this point in your career, but but would you, would you be considering adding the sort of features that are in class somehow to an LMS to to, to be, handle more of the scenario, you know, the flex scenario, the hybrid scenario and so it, forth? It, it's, it's really hard for the LMS companies to kind of compete with Zoom. Zoom just has, you know, a $2 billion backend architecture that they're leveraging to get mm. high-speed audio video. Now, I can tell you uh, as a was the former CEO of Blackboard. We used to have a product, Blackboard Collaborate. It's actually a good, very good product, but it took us a lot of time to just even get uh, kind of a, um, a, a smaller amount of bandwidth for the audio and video to work um, because we just didn't have all the resources that, that Zoom has. So very hard to compete with the Zoom, the Microsoft, and the Google on audio and video streaming. Um, I think that that ship has sailed. Those are the standards that are going to be out there. So certainly it's advantageous to look on building on top of them, which is what we've done. But I still consider that to be a very different market than the LMS market. The LMS is really about, you know, complementing the, the live class environment with asynchronous uh, um, um, uh, quizzes or tests or, or information. So you still attend your class, but after class, you might go online and download your homework. Um, what what class replaces is that actual live physical class. So a lot of the schools are using class and Zoom and, and still using Blackboard or Instructure or Moodle as their asynchronous piece and using them all together. I don't, I don't consider it um, competitive. It's very com much complementary. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, so Zoom um, itself, the company has really, I, I don't think it's uh, inaccurate to say achieved a, a massive you know, success relative to some of the other similar um, video, live video platforms like say WebEx or Skype. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on, on, on why that happened, because I'm not, I, I'm not an industry insider. I do see huge uptake of Zoom in uh, higher ed before the pandemic even occurred. And, and we, IMS for instance, switched over to Zoom as well because of that uh, before the pandemic ever even hit. But, but of course, then the pandemic hit and then it was Zoom everywhere, right? So do you have any thoughts on, on why that is? Maybe you just answered it already with your question in terms of the investment or whatever, but they've been a huge success, right? Yeah, look, there, there are three big things that separated Zoom. It's ease of use, very easy to use, not a complex system. You, you had just the, 
scalability. You could have 49 videos on the screen at the same time, you could handle large meetings. You didn't have any lags or problems. And it was easy then for you to share your screen or share content. And, and, and that was above anybody else's platform. So the, if, and if you thought it was important to see more people on the screen at the same time, which I would argue that it was, especially in education, then even though the other people caught up, they caught up post COVID, Zoom going in had the most people on a screen. That was a big differentiator for them. So, um, and then uh, lastly, I think that uh, a lot of education used them and that then actually sprouted out people that using them, you know, uh, you know uh, as COVID hit in their, in their personal lives, just bled over to business as well. So all those reasons combined, I think, to really help Zoom, uh, rightfully so, stand out as the leader. And even if Microsoft and Google have done a lot of catch up during the pandemic, you know, zooming into the pandemic with that big advantage, which is why I think that they became the the verb um, for holding the right. line. Right, right. Um, I just want to remind the audience: if you have any questions for uh, Michael that you want would want like me to relay to him, you need to type them into the chat window um, uh, that uh, I, I and both Kara and I are both monitoring. Um, so back to Zoom for a moment. Uh, you've uh, You've raised uh, quite quite a, a, a bit of uh, investment, um, but also, do you have some sort of special relationship with Zoom um, that, that might help uh, help the class, you know, uh, uh, move faster in some way, shape, or form um, in terms of as they're improving their platform uh, uh, as well? Well, I think longer term, Zoom really is going to become a platform, if you will, that other people can build off of, and, and the advantage mm -hmm. we have is we were one of the first people to jump on that bandwagon. I mean, literally maybe the first company that I'm aware of that really started seeing what they've done is building a platform that you can extend. And I'm assuming we focus in the education space. Now, certainly we also benefit from, you know, a large number of uh, the early Zoom investors. Um, uh, uh, um, Jim Scheiman, who actually helped name Zoom Zoom for Maven Ventures is an investor and board member in class. Bill Tai, literally the first investor of Zoom, a personal friend of Eric's is a uh, investor and on the board of class. Um, Santi from Emergence Capital, uh, who is a early investor in Zoom, is on the board of Zoom, is an investor in class and on our uh, board as well. Uh, and then we have a large number of uh, ed tech investors, uh, GSV, uh, OWL, Insights, uh, Learn, Reach Capital are our investors, and then even some companies, uh, Salesforce, and of course, uh, Tom Brady also uh, came along and invested uh, in class <laughs> as well. And then our last round was led by uh, SoftBank, uh, which is a, a, you know, a global fund. So, you know, um, Having that type of backing in general gives us a lot of advantages. I don't think it's specific to the relationship with Zoom, although Zoom has been an incredible partner. Um, Eric is uh, personally supportive, and the whole company has really been terrific to work with, which I think is very important as they're trying to build up an ecosystem. And I think we're at the, at the forefront of, uh, of uh, examples of what people can really do with this technology. Mm -hmm. Well, very impressive uh, fundraising there. I, uh, this next question is a little bit more geeky. Perhaps uh, we'll, we'll see, um, you know, Zoom, I wanted to mention that Zoom is also an IMS member organization and, and we are uh, engaging them on uh, some advanced integrations using the IMS LTI specific to the, the type of platform that they have. It's just, the work's just beginning. So those of you out here, out there who are listening in, you know, contact us if you want to be involved in that. But the other, the other area that's uh, 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 come up is analytics. So, you know, the data are particularly our higher ed institutions, but also the K-12 school districts have said, you know, which are slowly but surely starting to, you know, develop uh, architectures for learning analytics and other types of data analytics. Um, so the use of analytics data in terms of the use of video and collaboration products seems very, um, important, at least that's what we're hearing. Of course, we would hear that because we're a standards organization, but <laughs> are you hearing similar things in terms of the, the interest in the data from, from class and, and integrating it with other data you know, within the institutional enterprise? Um, absolutely. Uh, look, although I, I'll be honest and say that, look, in the beginning, people were just like, help me get online. <laughs> and almost like secondarily, there's nothing. And, um, look, one of the things that I'm actually the most excited about is that we have a a full dashboard of data. We actually track, and I think this is tracked for the first time. We're almost like collecting data like the money ball of class, if you will. We actually track how long the teacher held class for, how long the teacher spoke for, how long all the students spoke for, how long each individual student spoke for, how many students raised their hand, how many gave feedback from the teacher, 
how many chatted with the TA, how many chatted with fellow students, how you did on the exam and how long you took to take that exam. And we're actually tracking all of that data uh, in our system. So it can be not only produced in a report for the teacher, but we dump it all to an S3 server so the schools can run their own Tableau or other reports against it. And so I'm so excited about this because I think that this data is really going to help improve not only online learning, but learning overall. And this is the first time where you're capturing this level of money ball like data for what happens in the classroom. And I'm very excited to see what people are going to be able to do with this data about really improving student outcomes and uh, class success. That's great. That's great. Because we we also believe, uh, you know, this is an important area for evolution of some of the IMS standards, you know, particularly uh, what's called Caliper. Yeah. And uh, so so again, you know, as you said, it's been a little bit difficult getting people's attention. You know, during the, <laughs> but, but, but my areas, definition, but... that's what, that's what comes. <laughs> yeah. My definition, that's what comes next. Look, in the early days of Blackboard, yeah. was asking about the data, it wasn't until they were all set up that they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> now what can they show us. So similarly, now that people yeah. are getting set up and organized, they're absolutely saying, wow, what can this data tell us about what's happening in our classrooms live? Yeah. So the, the next question is one that could take us in a lot of different directions. But, uh, you know, before you uh, uh, were doing this, it's been a while since we've, we've chatted. And, uh, you know, but, but you've been around, you know, a long time, like I have. And uh, you, you were one of the key leaders in inventing the LMS category. And, I just wanted to ask you like some perspective sort of questions uh, or around, you know, what, what surprises you the most about, say, the last 20 years of progress in terms of the application of technology to education? What surprises you or really what are you excited about? I mean, I'd really love to hear your views because you've got quite a uh, perspective on that. Um, well, you know, the, the, there's some irony that, of course, this pandemic came along and everyone ended up defaulting to a live meeting collaboration tool like Zoom as opposed to the LMSs that they all have installed. So I, I do find it interesting that apparently for all the years of work that this entire industry had done to be learning online, it was an outside meeting tool that ended up becoming the standard for learning. So I find that interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it interesting that, that, that K-12 hasn't done more before the pandemic with learning. I mean, I thought that they you know, used to trail, you know, higher it a little bit, but I would have thought there would have been more incorporation of online courses a little bit earlier, although I now think that because of the pandemic, that is that has certainly changed. Um, and then lastly, look, I, as, as I opened this conversation with, I mean, you can't train hundreds of thousands of teachers and millions of students in online learning, not just here in the United States, but around the world. I mean, for the first time, you know, every country moves all of their classes online all, all together. Uh, I don't think we've begun to see the ramifications of that. And I think the next 12 to 18 months are going to be some of the most exciting times in ed tech that we've ever seen, because it's not about having the technology available, it's about how it's adopted and perceived, and all that's just changed in the last 12 months. So I think that uh, the innovation that you're going to see, uh, the amount of online programs that are going to be developed uh, post-pandemic, I think you're really, for the first time, going to see the lowering of cost and the increase of access of education around the globe. And I think it's an exciting time to be part of the, the education and the ed tech market space. It's really, it really is a, a, a fascinating time, because none of us really know, you know, exactly how things will evolve from this point forward. But um, certainly, you know, the, 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 and we have sessions at this conference on this, you know, the, all the LMSs saw even greater uptake, right, during the pandemic. But as you said, they didn't really cover the full spectrum of what is really needed to kind of move online, you know, rapidly, so to speak, or certainly not the the kind of the kind of flex or hybrid uh, perspective. Same thing with with as I already mentioned, you know, Teams and Google Classroom and all different types of uh, digital learning products. Right? There's been a big uh, rise in digital learning products. In fact, in some ways, it's uh, it's sort of created created a a open people's eyes in terms yeah. of well, how do we make sure we now have digital completely completely covered, you know, um, uh, and, and that is, that is a uh, matter of fact, my next uh, session after this one is with uh, Latanya McDade from, who was formerly Chicago Public Schools and now at Prince William County Schools at Chicago Public Schools led a curriculum equity initiative, which was all about making sure that there was a core digital curriculum that could be used everywhere and customized and so forth. Um, I'm, and I'm saying all that, um, 
not necessarily advertised by next session, but, but, but because I'm wondering, I, I, I do sort of, it does sort of feel right. Like once the dust settles in, there's gotta be some thought given, uh, more thought given to, well, how do we make sure we're really covered, whether it's at the state level, right? And it ties into issues like, uh, you know, uh, bandwidth, right? And all that, so that's, that sort of thing as well. But how do we make sure we're covered either at the state level, at a school district level, at a university level? What have we learned and how do we, how do we go about and be even better prepared? And then, like you said, actually use it for other purposes to allow more flex in how education is delivered. So I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think we're gonna see more of that kind of, you know, top-down executive level sort of thinking about this whole thing? Or do you think people are just gonna go be like, phew, I'm glad the I'm glad the pandemic is over and uh, you know, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think about that? No, 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 I think right now people are saying, okay, phew, I'm glad it seems like we're nearing the end and back to normal, but yeah, even if the pandemic was 100% over, uh, you can't undo the change of every kid has had a taste and learned what it's like to take an online class. And that just means that as they, as K-12 moves forward into college, there'll be more online classes, that they'll be more willing to take a more online program, more opportunities for kids to continue in school. And even in the K-12, they're going to have to take into consideration, hey, maybe we can have a broader outreach or have new, more advanced classes that we weren't able to otherwise support. I, I think everything has changed. I think we're in a little bit of a lull right now because there's so much technology. We threw every single possible solution at all the problems we were having. And so now you're going to see it uh, even out for a little bit. And then there'll be a second wave of adoption because, um, again, it's become the norm. And from a from a personal perspective, I'm just kind of wondering. Uh, you know, obviously, you seem like the perfect person, or uh, you know, to be to be leading something like this. And um, and uh, but obviously, also, you're very successful in the sector already. And I know you've did some work in some some other sectors uh, as well between uh, now and in the past with with Blackboard. You know, how, how, why did you decide just as a person on a personal level? I know you already talked about the need you, that you saw, but, but why, why do you feel that, that personally that this is an important, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for you that you wanted to help, help lead this forward? Well, look, I, I mean, I'll believe it or not, I just has to do at the end of the day with my own children. I, I saw the mm -hmm. challenges that they were having and engaging in classes online. And I also recognized at the same time, it wasn't just about this pandemic, but it was about how they were going to engage in education for, for the rest of their lives. And yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I was probably uh, uniquely uh, situated because I was uh, doing nothing during the pandemic. I knew a lot about ed tech, knew that the Zoom had an SDK and had the, the, the resources and the connections to be able to take this idea and, and bring it to fruition. But the reason I'm doing this is because I'm, I'm passionate about making a difference. You know, after Blackboard, I never thought I would necessarily have another opportunity to be part of a, a company that did as important of a work or has big of an influence. But here, I, I actually think, look, uh, there's 130,000 schools around the world using just Zoom technology. Um, and uh, I think that what we offer offers a significant improvement to really personalize Zoom for uh, the education space. And so I think, wow, once again, I have the ability to, to make a difference in, in the way people teach and learn around the world. So who wouldn't want to be a part of that? And who wouldn't want to, to, to jump in if they thought that they could be helpful during these especially dire times of the pandemic? But even longer term, if you can make a difference and truly lower the cost and increase access to education, then you've made the world a better place. And that's the idea. Yeah. Of us. I don't know if this is a record speed, you know, for for a startup. We have a lot of we have a lot of you know in terms of the investment and the growth in the ed tech sector. Probably, probably is or is close to that. We have lots of entre small entrepreneurial companies that are engaged. Uh, in IMS and, uh, uh, but, but first, and I wanted to ask you maybe if you have any recommend recommendations for them, but first I thought, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, around the world and we also have members in various parts of the world, particularly Europe, uh, Japan, South Korea, you know, the uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, and we're growing, you know, our, our presence in Europe is growing, even though we're not making too much investment there at this time because we can't really travel over there. We haven't been able to go over there for, but we do have some people there. What are you seeing? Is is it is have you had enough experience now to have some thoughts about are there parts of the world where what class is doing sort of makes more sense or or less sense? Um, or is it still too early for well, that? Well, I think it's not about uh, whether it makes uh, more sense or not. Like right now our technology is only on Zoom. So we're big in the countries that Zooms are uh, very big in. So we get a lot of interest from um, 
Japan and the Middle East and Brazil and all throughout Europe. Um, but no, look, I, I, I think online education is a, 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 a global answer to a global problem of how do you elevate uh, the, the population and the workforce. And so I think the technology we're building is, is pertinent around the world, uh, although we're primarily focused on countries that utilize Zoom technology um, because that's you know where we built uh, our backbone on top of. Okay, great, yeah. And I guess I would assume the integration scenarios must be somewhat different than those other this other parts of the, the world um, in terms of the which platform. Well, since you're built on Zoom, if they're using Zoom, then you're good. Yeah. I'm just guessing there's less LMS from we, what we see. There's probably less LMS uses in some of these areas bit, and yeah. other technologies. Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, I'm not seeing any questions from the audience, but if they, if audience, you're, you're only got a, we only have a few couple of minutes left here. So if you want to get one in, now's your time. Um, okay. So a successful ed tech entrepreneur, one time, maybe now a second time, we'll see. Um, <laughs> certainly, it certainly feels like it's going in the right direction. What, what's your, what, you must have tons of entrepreneurs that come to you and ask you for, you know, advice about, uh, you know, how do you, how do you really do something that works in education, right, in the education sector and the learning sector, because it is a very nuanced field um, and so forth. And what, you must, you must have some thoughts on that. I'd just like you to, to say anything you'd like to about it. Look, uh, I, I think that what makes the education field so unique is the willingness of the institutions themselves to be part of developing the solution. So the one thing that I learned mm -hmm. at Blackboard that we're absolutely implementing your class is one of the first things we did was we put together a product advisory board made up of the very institutions that we hope eventually use our technology. Because even though we had this idea that, wait a minute, I think if we incorporated teaching and learning tools into Zoom, that this could be a benefit. It wasn't until we started working with them that we really saw how that should uh, end up uh, being implemented and what that workflow should be and getting that buy-in of the community. The community education is just so important. So, you know, a class for us is not just about building technology, it's about building in conjunction with the community to make sure that we're meeting their needs and doing it in a way that's very collaborative. Because that's why we've partnered with dozens of institutions to help bring this technology to market. And so the one piece of advice I always give to people who are focused in the tech field is just that. Don't just, you can't just come up with an idea on your own. Make sure you're working with the faculty, the teachers, the administrators, the back office technologists, the CIOs, or even the presidents to really best understand not only their needs as they see it across all of education, but their own institutions direct needs and how the solution that you wanna build can help address that and then do it in conjunction with them because they're more than willing to take the time to help because they know the importance of deploying uh, a, a good technology at their institution. Um, and so that's what I think really makes the education market so unique. Are there are there particular types of institutions you're looking at, you know, partnering with right now, you know, whether it's higher ed or K-12 or, you know, for to, to do that sort of thing uh, with class technologies? I mean, we are talking with institutions from uh, uh, Ivy League uh, school, <laughs> four, four year and two year and community colleges and really, uh, you know, across the board, anyone who is doing teaching or doing teaching online, you know, benefits greatly from our technology, which is a long winded way of saying every school. Um, and, uh, and certainly different schools have different uh, unique needs or challenges. Uh, and so we're working to make sure that our technology can support all of the different modes and all of those different strategies of education and have the schools bring it online. Are you looking at any, uh, I, don't, I don't think, I'm, I'm not aware of anything, but are there any sort of state run Zoom installations in the US? I don't think so. It's all uh, probably at the it, school district level. It's mostly at the school district level. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't mean that we're not speaking to a few states as well. So. Yeah, yeah, because that is one of the trends we're seeing, right? Uh, uh, but uh, again, probably motivated by the pandemic is just that, well, there's more interest from the state level of how can they be help their school yes. districts be prepared and so forth. Well, uh, everyone, I wanted to thank you for tuning in. I especially wanted to thank Michael for a great session and answering all my questions. And uh, now, uh, for those of you that have listened in or are watching the recording, now you know everything you wanted to know about class technologies and this new uh, collaborative uh, product sector. And I uh, look forward to seeing everybody um, in other Learning Impact sessions or hopefully maybe somewhere in person soon. So thank you, Michael. Really appreciate it. Rob, Rob it was great seeing you again. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation. If people are interested in learning more, they can visit class.com. And I'm looking